The story I'm going to tell you was written by a man who signed his work Saki, S-A-K-I. His real name was H. H. Monroe. The afternoon was hot and humid, and the railway compartment was stuffy and sticky. The next stop was Templecombe, nearly an hour away. The occupants were a small girl, and a smaller girl, and a small boy. An aunt belonging to those children occupied one corner seat by the window, and the op on the opposite side, in the further corner seat, was a bachelor, a stranger to them. The aunt and the children conversed in a limited, persistent way. The aunt's remarks all, all began with don't, and the children's began with why. <laughs> the bachelor said nothing. <laughs> don't, Cyril, don't, as the small boy began smacking the cushions of the, the seat, producing a cloud of dust. Come and look out of the window. The child moved reluctantly toward the window. Then suddenly, in the distance, something caught his attention. Why are those sheep being driven out of that field? I suppose they're being driven to another field where there's more grass. But there's lots of grass in that field. There's nothing else there but grass. There's lots of grass in that field. Maybe, maybe the grass in the other field is better. Why is it better? Look at the cows. There have been cows in nearly every field all along the way. But she spoke as if she were calling his attention to something novel. Why is the grass in the other field better? The frown on the bachelor's face was deepening into a scowl. The aunt decided in her mind that he was a hard, unsympathetic man. The smaller girl created a diversion by singing a little song. Three blind mice, three blind mice, see how they run, see, and so forth. She knew the song very well, and she sang it quite audibly, and she sang it over and over and over and over. It occurred to the bachelor that Perhaps uh, someone had made a bet with her that she could not repeat that little song 2,000 times without stopping. <laughs> Whoever it was was likely to lose the bet. <laughs> Come over here and listen to a story. The children moved listlessly toward the aunt's end of the compartment. In a low, well-modulated voice, interrupted frequently by the children. She told a deplorable story about a little girl who was good and who made friends with people because she was so good and who was finally saved from a rampaging bull by a crowd of rescuers who admired her moral character. Wouldn't they have bothered to save her if she weren't so good as the bigger of the small girls? That was precisely the question that was in the bachelor's mind. Well, yes, but I don't think they would have run quite so fast to help her if they didn't like her so much. That's the stupidest story I ever heard, said the bigger of the small girls. I didn't listen after the first bit, said Cyril. It was so stupid. <laughs> the smaller girl had no comment on the story, but she had long ago resumed the repetition of her favorite song. You don't seem to be a success as a storyteller, mm -hmm. said the bachelor. All the aunt bristled at that. It's a very difficult thing to tell stories that children can both understand and appreciate. I don't agree. Oh, really? <laughs> well, perhaps you would like to tell them a story. Oh, tell us a story, tell us a story, 
demanded the bigger of the two girls. Well, it took the bachelor a, a moment or two, but he began with a good deal of confidence. Once upon a time, there was a little girl called Bertha, who was extraordinarily good. The children's interest began to flicker. All stories seemed alike, no matter who told them. She did everything she was told. She was always truthful, kept her clothing neat and clean. She ate oatmeal as if it were ice cream, and learned her lessons perfectly, and was polite in her manners. Was she pretty, asked the bigger of the small girls. Oh, not as pretty as any of you, but she was horribly good. There was a reaction in favor of the story. The <laughs> word horrible in connection with goodness had a ring of truth about it. She was so good that she had won several medals for goodness, which she always wore, pinned to her dress. There was a medal for obedience, another medal for punctuality, and a third for good behavior. Now these were large metal medals, and they clinked against each other as she walked. No other child in her town had three medals. So everybody knew that she must be an extra good child. Horribly good, said Cyril. <laughs> Everybody talked about her goodness. And the prince of the country got to hear about it. And he said that since she was so very good, she would be allowed to walk in his park once a week. It was a beautiful park. No children were ever allowed in it. So it was a great honor for birth. Were there any sheep in the park? No, there were no sheep. Why weren't there any sheep? <laughs> the aunt permitted herself a little smile just to herself. There were no sheep in the park. Mm -hmm. Well, because the prince's mother once had a dream that her son would be killed either by a sheep or else by a clock falling on him. And for that reason, the prince never kept a sheep in his park, and he didn't have a clock in his palace. The aunt suppressed a gasp of admiration. Was the prince killed by a sheep or by a clock? He is still alive, so we don't know if the dream will come true. Anyway, there were no sheep in the park, but there were lots of little pigs running all over the place. What color were they? They were black with white faces, and white with black faces, and black all over, and white all over. The storyteller paused to let these images sink into the children's imaginations. And then he resumed. There were other things. Oh, Bertha was sorry to find that there were no flowers in the park. She had promised her aunts that she would not pick any of the prince's flowers. And she meant to keep that promise. So it made her feel disappointed that there were no flowers to pick, or not to pick. Why weren't there any flowers? The pigs had eaten them all. <laughs> the gardeners told the prince, you can't have pigs and flowers. You can have flowers with no pigs, or you can have pigs with no flowers, but you can't have pigs and flowers. So the prince decided that he wanted pigs and no flowers. There was a murmur of approval of the prince's decision. There were other things in the park. There were ponds with gold and blue green fish. There were trees with parrots that said clever things, and hummingbirds that hummed all the popular songs of the day. 
Bertha walked up and down and enjoyed herself immensely. And as she walked, she thought to herself, if I were not so extraordinarily good, I would not be allowed to come into this beautiful park and enjoy everything that there is to see. And as she walked, her three medals clinked against one another, and they reminded her how very good she was. Just then, an enormous wolf came into the park to see if it could catch a fat little pig for its supper. What color was it? Mud color, all over, and it had a long black tongue and pale gray eyes that gleamed with ferocity. The first thing it saw in the park was Bertha. Her dress was so white and clean it could be seen from a great distance. Bertha saw the wolf and saw that it was skulking toward her and she began to wish that she had never been allowed to come into this park. She ran as fast as she could, and the wolf came after her with leaps and bounds. When she got, came to a clump of myrtle bushes, she hid herself among them, and the wolf came sniffing among the branches, its black tongue lolling out of its mouth. Bertha was terribly frightened, and she thought to herself, if I had not been so extraordinarily good, I would be safe in town at this moment. Fortunately, the scent of the myrtle was so strong that the wolf could not sniff out where Bertha was hiding. And the bushes were so thick, he might have hunted in them a long time without catching sight of her. So he decided that he might as well go off and catch a little pig instead. Bertha was trembling at having the wolf sniffing and prowling so close to her. And as she trembled, the medal for obedience clinked against the medals for good conduct and punctuality. The wolf was just moving away when he heard the sound of the metals clinking. He stopped to listen. They clinked again in a bush right near him. He dashed into the bush and dragged Bertha out and devoured her to the last morsel. All that was left were her shoes, a few bits of clothing, and the three medals for goodness. Were any of the little pigs killed? No, they all escaped. <laughs> the story began badly, said the smaller of the two girls, but it had a beautiful ending. <laughs> It is the most beautiful story I ever heard, said the bigger of the smaller girls. It's the only beautiful story I've ever heard, said Cyril. The aunt had a different opinion. <laughs> that is a most improper story to tell to young children. You have undermined the effects of years of careful teaching. The bachelor shrugged his shoulders, collected his belongings, and got ready to leave. I kept them quiet for ten minutes, he said. Unhappy woman, he thought to himself, as he walked the platform of Templecombe Station. For the next six months, those children will bedevil her for an, with demands for an improper story. Ha, 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 ha.